Let's see how we're doing now. All right, making my way back. Check, check. Test, 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 test. Yay! All right, it sounds better. <laughs> Good. Okie doke. I'll, I'm going to hold for everyone to join us again. All right, I uh, believe the sound is better now. So <laughs> we can continue on our adventure. Now for, for folks that are going to join us or rewatch this, um, I'm just gonna quickly go through those pictures again. So did a little research and found that this is a, an accurate image of the um, Rumkorf lamp that the divers, our characters were using to illuminate the surface when they went on their under the sea hunt. So I thought that was really cool. So here is that lamp, and this was a real invention. Also found some examples of deep sea coral. So different from the coral that lives closer to the sun, uh, closer to the more shallower waters, a surface. Um, so this is the type of coral that one would see at the in the deep sea. And then the zoophytes, these are those plant-like creatures that are living uh, near the depths of the ocean. And there's, they really are, they look like this hybrid of animal and plant. You can see in the way that they're structured, very plant-like, but they are technically animals. Cool. Okay, well, I know we're all anxious to get started. So let's, uh, let's go for it. So we are on, <clears throat> this is chapter... 18, Vanacoro and our characters have just discovered the sunken ship, the Florida Sunderland. This terrible spectacle was the forerunner of the series of maritime catastrophes that the Nautilus was destined to meet within its route. As long as it went through more frequented waters, we often saw the hulls of shipwrecked vessels that were rotting in the depths and deeper down cannons, bullets, anchors, chains, and a thousand other iron materials eaten up by rust. However, on the 11th day of December, we sighted the Pompato Islands, the old dangerous group of Bougainville that extend over a space of 500 leagues at ESE to WNE. From the island Ducey, that of Lazareff, this group covers an area of 370 square leagues, and it is formed of 60 groups of islands, among which the Gambier group is remarkable, over which France exercises sway. These are coral islands, slowly raised but continuous, created by the daily work of Polypi. Then this new island will be joined later on to the neighboring groups, and a fifth continent will stretch from New Zealand and New Caledonia, and from thence to the Marquesas. One day, when I was suggesting this theory to Captain Nemo, he replied coldly, The Earth does not want new continents, but new men. Chance had conducted the Nautilus toward the island of Clermont-Tonnerre, one of the most curious of the group that was discovered in 1822 by Captain Bell of the Minerva. I could study now the Majoporal system to which are due the islands in this ocean. Majopores, which must not be mistaken for corals, have a tissue lined with a, cal with a calcareous crust. 
and the modifications of its structure have induced Monsieur Milne Edwards, my worthy master, to class them into five sections. The animacule that the marine polypus secretes live by millions at the bottom of their cells. This calcareous deposits become rocks, reefs, and large and small islands. Here they form a ring surrounding a little inland lake that communicates with the sea by means of gaps. There they make barriers of reefs like those on the coasts of the New Caledonia and the various Pomotan Islands. In other places, like those of Reunion and at Maurice, they raise fringed reefs, high, straight walls, near which the depth of the ocean is considerable. Some cable links off the shore of the island of Claremont. I admired the gigantic work accomplished by these microscopical workers. These walls are specially the work of those madripoors known as milliporas, porites, madripoors, and astronaes. These polypi are found particularly in the rough beds of the sea near the surface, and consequently it is from the upper part that they begin their operations, in which they bury themselves by degrees with the debris of the secretions that support them. Such is, at least, Darwin's theory, who thus explains the formation of the atolls, a superior theory, to my mind, to that given of the foundation of the madriporical works summits of mountains or volcanoes that are submerged some feet below the, s the level of the sea. I could observe closely these curious walls, for perpendicularly they were more than 300 yards deep, and our electric sheets lighted up this calca calcareous matter brilliantly. Replying to a question Conceal asked me as to the time these colossal barriers took to be raised, I astonished him much by telling him that learned men reckoned it about the eighth of an inch in a hundred years. Towards evening, Clermont Tonnier was lost in the distance, and the route of the Nautilus was sensibly changed. After having crossed the Tropic of Capricorn in 130 degrees longitude, it sailed west by northwest, making again for the tropical zone. Although the summer sun was very strong, we did not suffer from heat, for at 15 or 20 fathoms below the surface, the temperature did not rise above from 10 to 12 degrees. On the 15th of December, we left to the east the bewitching group of the societies and the graceful Tahiti Queen of the Pacific. I saw in the morning some miles to the windward the elevated summits of the island. These waters furnished our table with excellent fish, mackerel, bonitos, and some varieties of sea serpent. On the 25th of December, the Nautilus sailed into the midst of the new Hebrides discovered by Quiros in 1606, and that of Bougainville explored in 1768, and to which Cook gave its present name in 1773. This group is composed principally of nine large islands that form a band of 120 leagues north by, well, I'm not sure what NNS is referring to, I'm assuming it's the um, direction, so we'll just say NNS to SSW, between 15 degrees and 2 degrees southerly latitude, and 164 degrees and 168 degrees longitude. We passed tolerably near to the island of Aru, that at noon looked like a mass of green wood surmounted by a peak of great height. That day being Christmas Day, Ned Land seemed to regret sorely the non-celebration of Christmas, the family fete of which Protestants are so fond. I had not seen Captain Nemo for a week when, on the morning of the 27th, he came into the large drawing room, always seeming as if he had seen you five minutes before. I was busily tracing the route of the Nautilus on the planisphere. The captain came up to me, put his finger on one spot on the chart, and said this single word, Vanikoro. The effect was magical. It was the name of the islands on which La Perouse had been lost. I rose suddenly. The Nautilus has brought us to Vanikoro? I asked. Yes, Professor, said the captain, and I can visit the celebrated islands where Boussole and the Astrolabe struck. If you like, Professor, when shall we be there? We are there now. Followed by Captain Nemo, I went up to the platform and greedily scanned the horizon. To the northeast, two volcanic islands submerged of unequal size, surrounded by a coral reef that measured 40 miles in circumference. 
We were close to Vanacoru, really the one to which Dumont de Reville gave the name of Isle de la Recherche, and exactly facing the little harbor of Vanu, situated in 16 degrees, 4 degrees southern latitude, and 164 to 32 degrees eastern longitude. The earth seemed covered with verdure from the shore to the summits in the interior that were crowned by Mount Capago, 476 feet high. The Nautilus, having passed the outer belt of rocks by a narrow strait, found itself among breakers where the sea was from 30 to 40 fathoms deep. Under the verdant shade of some mangroves, I perceived some savages who appeared greatly surprised at our approach. In the long black body, moving between wind and water, did they not see some formidable cetacean that they regarded with suspicion? Just then, Captain Nemo asked me what I knew about the wreck of La, La Perouse. Only what everyone knows, Captain, I replied. And could you tell me what everyone knows about it? He inquired, ironically, easily. I related to him all that the last works of Dumont d'Urville had made known, works from which the following is a brief account. La Perouse and his second, Captain de Lange, uh, were sent by Louis, Louis XVI in 1785 on a voyage of circumnavigation. They embarked in the corvettes Boussole and the Astrolab, neither of which were again heard of. In 1791, the French government, justly uneasy as to the fate of these two sloops, manned two large merchantmen, the Recherche and the Espérance, which left Brest the 28th of September under the command of Bruni d'Entrecasteaux. Two months after, they learned from Bowen, uh, commander of the Albemarle, that the debris of shipwrecked vessels had been seen on the coast of New Georgia. But D'Entrecasto, ignoring this communication, rather uncertain besides, directed his course towards the Admiralty Islands, mentioned in a report of Captain Hunter's as being the place where La Perouse was, was wrecked. They sought in vain. The Esperance and the Recherche passed before Vanikoro without stopping there, and, in fact, this voyage was most disastrous, as it cost D'Entrecasto his, his life and those of two of his lieutenants, besides several of his crew. Captain Dillon, a shrewd old Pacific sailor, was the first to find unmistakable traces of the wrecks. On the 15th of May, 1824, his vessel, the St. Patrick, passed close to Tecopia, one of the new Hebrides. There, a Lasker, Alaska came alongside in a canoe, sold him the handle of a sword and silver that bore the print of characters engraved on the hilt. The Lascar pretended that six years before, during a stay at Vanikoru, he had seen two Europeans that belonged to some vessels that had run aground on the reef some years ago. Dylan guessed that he meant La Perouse, whose disappearance had troubled the whole world. He tried to get on to Vanikoru, where, according to the Lascar, he would find numerous debris of the, of the wreck, but winds and tides prevented him. Dillon returned to Calcutta. There he interested the Asiatic Society and the Indian Company in his discovery. A vessel to which was given the name of the Recherche was put at his disposal, and he set out on the 23rd of January, 1827, accompanied by a French agent. The Recherche, after touching at several points in the Pacific, cast anchor before Vanikoru, 7th of July, 1827, in that same harbor of Vanu where the Nautilus was at this time. There it collected numerous relics of the wreck, iron utensils, anchors, pulley straps, swivel guns, an 18-pound shot, fragments of astronomical instruments, a piece of crown work, and a bronze clock bearing this inscription, Bazin Maffei, the mark of the foundry of the arsenal at Brest about 18... Excuse me, 1785. There could be no further doubt. Dillon, having made all inquiries, stayed in the unlucky place till October. Then he quitted Vanikoru and directed his course towards New Zealand, put into Calcutta, 7th of April, 1828, and returned to France, where he was warmly welcomed by Charles X. But at the time, without knowing Dillon's movements, Dumont d'Urville had already set out to find the scene of the wreck, and they had learned from a whaler that some medals and a cross of St. Louis, Louis had been found in the hands of some savages of Louisiade and New Caledonia. 
Dumont d'Urville, commander of the Astrolabe, had then sailed, and two months after Dillon had left Vanakaru, he put into Hobar town. There he learned the results of Dillon's inquiries and found that a certain James Hobbs, second lieutenant of the Union of Calcutta, after landing on an island situated 8 degrees, 18 degrees southern latitude and 156 degrees, 30 degrees eastern longitude, had some seen some iron bars and red stuffs used by the natives of these parts. Dumont d'Urville, much perplexed and not knowing how to credit the reports of low-class journals, decided to follow Dillon's track. On the 10th of February, 1828, the Astrolabe appeared off Tocopia and took as guide and interpreter a deserter found on the island. He made his way to Vanakoru, sighted it on the, 12th, on the 12th and lay among the reefs under, uh, until the 14th and not until the 20th did he cast anchor within the barrier in the harbor of Venu. On the 23rd, several officers went round the island and brought back some unimportant trifles. The natives, adopting a system of denials and evasions, refused to take them to the unlucky place. This ambiguous conduct led them to believe that the natives had ill-treated the castaways, and indeed they seemed to fear that Dumont d'Urville had come to avenge La Perouse and his unfortunate crew. However, on the 26th, appeased by some presence and understanding that they had no reprisals to fear, they led Monsieur Jacques Huero to the scene of the wreck. There, in three or four fathoms of water between the reefs of Paco and Venu, lay anchors, cannons, pigs of lead and iron embedded in the limey uh, con concretions. The large boat and the whaler belonging to the Astrolab were sent to this place, and not without some difficulty. Their crews hauled up an anchor weighing 1,800 pounds, a brass gun, some pigs of iron, and two copper swivel guns. Dumont d'Urville, questioning the natives, learned, too, that La Perouse, after losing both his vessels on the reefs of the island, had constructed a smaller boat, only to be lost a second time, where no one knew. But the French government, fearing that Dumont d'Urville was not acquainted with Dillon's movements, had sent the sloop Bayonnaise, commanded by Legarant de Tromelin, to Vonic Coru, which had been stationed on the west coast of America. The Bayonnaise cast her anchor before Vanikoru some months after the departure of the Astrolab, but found no new document, but stated that the savages had respected the monument to La Perouse. That is the substance of what I told Captain Nemo. So, he said, no one knows where the third vessel perished as constructed by the castaways on the island of Vanikoru. No one knows. Captain Nemo said nothing, but signed to me to follow him into the large saloon. The Nautilus sank several yards below the waves, and the panels were opened. I hastened to the aperture, and under the crustaceans of coral covering with fungi, siphonules, alcyons, madrepores, through myriads of charming fish, gorels, glyphisidri, pomphorides, diacopes, and holocenters, I recognized certain debris that the drags had not been able to tear up. Iron stirrups, anchors, cannons, bullets, capstan fittings, the stem of a ship, all objects clearly proving the wreck of some vessel, and now carpeted with living flowers. While I was looking on this desolate scene, Captain Nemo said in a sad voice, Commander La Perouse set out 7th of December, 1785, with his vessels La Boussole and the Astrolabe. Her first cast anchor at Botany Bay visited the Friendly Isles, New Caledonia, then directed his course towards Santa Cruz and put it into Namuka, one of the Hape group. Then his vessel struck on the unknown reefs of Vanikoru. The Boussole, which went first, ran aground on the southerly coast. The Astrolabe went to its help and ran aground too. The first vessel was destroyed almost immediately. The second, stranded under the wind, resisted some days. The natives made the castaways welcome. They installed themselves in the island and constructed a smaller boat with the debris of the two larger ones. Some sailors stayed willingly at Vanikoru, the others, weak and ill, set out with La Perouse. They directed their course towards the Solomon Islands, and there perished with everything, on the westerly coast of the chief island of the group, between Cape's deception and satisfaction. How do you know that? By this that I found on the spot where was, where was the last wreck. 
Captain Nemo showed me a tin plate box, stamped with the French arms and corroded by the salt water. He opened it, and I saw a bundle of papers, yellow but still readable. They were the instructions of the naval minister to Commander La Perouse, annotated in the margin in Louis the Sixth the sixteenth's handwriting. Ah, it is a fine death for a sailor, said Captain Nemo at last. A coral tomb makes a quiet grave, and I trust that I and my comrades will find no other. All right. <laughs> Let's see how we're doing. All right, excellent. So I'm, I'm wondering if if those were real shipwrecks or not. I mean, it seems like Jules Verne does like to bring a fair amount of reality uh, into the science fiction. Um, so that'll be really interesting to investigate. Otherwise, um, I wonder I wonder what that in particular, these, these shipwrecks will mean narratively um, for the story itself, but I'm very curious. So let's keep going. So we are moving on to chapter um, 19. The Torres Straits. During the night of the 27th or 28th of December, the Nautilus left the shores of Vanakoru with great speed. Her course was southwesterly, and in three days she had gone over the 750 leagues that separated it from La Perouse's group and the southeast point of Papua. Early on the 1st of January, 1863, Conceal joined me on the platform. Master, will you permit me to wish you a happy new year? <laughs> what? Conceal, exactly as if I was in at Paris in my study at Jardin des Plans? Well, I accept your good wishes and thank you for them. Only I will ask you what you mean by a happy new year under our circumstances. Do you mean the year that will bring us to the end of our imprisonment, or the year that sees us continue this strange voyage? Really, I do not know how to answer, Master. We are sure to see curious things, and for the last two months we have not had time for dullness. The last marvel is always the most astonishing, and if we continue this progression, I do not know how it will end. It is my opinion that we shall never again see the like. I think then, with no offense to Master, that a happy new year would be one in which we could see everything. On the 2nd of January, we had made 11,340 miles, or, or 5,250 French leagues, since our starting point in the Japan Seas. Before the ship's head stretched the dangerous shores of the Coral Sea on the northeast coast of Australia, our boat Excuse me. Our boat lay along some miles from the redoubtable bank on which Cook's vessel was lost, the 10th of June, 1770. The boat in which Cook was struck on a rock, and if it did not sink, it was owing to a piece of coral that was broken by the shock and fixed itself in the broken keel. I had wished to visit this, the reef, 360 leagues long, against which the sea, always rough, broke with great violence, with a noise like thunder. But just then the inclined plains drew the Nautilus down to a great depth, and I could see nothing of the high coral walls. I had to content myself with the different specimens of fish brought up by the nets. I remarked, among others, some, germ some germans, a species of mackerel as large as a tunny, with bluish sides and striped with transverse bands that disappear with the animal's life. These fish followed us in shoals and furnished us with very delicate food. We took also a large number of gilt heads, about one and a half inches long, tasting like dories, and flying pyrapeds like submarine swallows, which in dark nights light alter alternately the air and water with their phosphorescent light. Among the mollusks in the zoophytes, I found in the meshes of the net several species of al al sirenarians. <laughs> <laughs> Akini, hammers, spurs, dials, searites, and highly trying my best. <laughs> the flora was represented by beautiful floating seaweeds, laminare, and macrocysts impregnated with the mucilage that transudes through their pores, and among which I gathered an admirable nemostoma gelinerous. Jelinierois, <laughs> that was classed among the, na the natural curiosities of the museum. 
Two days after crossing the Coral Sea, the 4th of January, we sighted the Papuan coasts. On this occasion, Captain Nemo informed me that his intention was to get into the Indian Ocean by the Strait of Torres. His communication ended there. The Torres Straits are nearly 34 leagues wide, but they are obstructed by an innumerable quantity of islands, islets, breakers, and rocks that make its, in, its navigation almost impracticable, so that Captain Nemo took all needful precautions to cross them. The Nautilus, floating betwixt wind and water, went at a moderate pace. Her screw, like a cetacean's tail, beat the waves slowly. Profiting by this, I and my two companions went up to the deserted platform. Before us was the steerman's cage, and I expected that Captain Nemo was there directing the course of the Nautilus. I had before me the excellent charts of the Straits of Torres, and I consulted them attentively. Around the Nautilus, the sea dashed furiously. The course of the waves that went from southeast to northwest at the rate of two and a half miles broke on the coral that showed itself here and there. This is a bad sea, remarked Ned Land. Detestable indeed, and one that does not suit a boat like the Nautilus. The captain must be very sure of his route, for I see there are pieces of coral that would do for its keel if it only touched them slightly. Indeed, the situation was dangerous, but the Nautilus seemed to slide like magic off these rocks. It did not follow the routes of the Astrolabe and the, and the Zaley exactly, for they proved fatal to Dumont d'Urville. It bore more northwards, coasted the islands of Murray, and came back to the southwest towards Cumberland Passage. I thought it was going to pass, by, pass it by when, going back to northwest, it went through a large quantity of islands and islets little known, towards the island sound and canal mauvaise. I wondered if Captain Nemo, foolishly and prudent, could, would steer his vessel into that pass where Dumont d'Urville two corvettes touched. When swerving again and cutting straight through to the west, he steered for the island of Gilboa. It was then three in the afternoon. The tide began to recede, being quite full. The Nautilus approached the island that I still saw with its remarkable border of screw pines. He stood off it at about two miles distant. Suddenly a shock overthrew me. The Nautilus just touched a rock and stayed immovable, laying lightly to port side. When I rose, I perceived Captain Nemo and his lieutenant on the platform. They were examining the situation of the vessel and exchanging words in their incomprehensible dialect. She was situated thus. Two miles on the starboard side appeared Gilboa, stretching from north to west like an immense arm. Towards the south and east, some coral showed itself, left by the ebb. We had run aground, and in one of those seas where the tides are middling, a sorry matter for the floating of the Nautilus, However, the vessel had not suffered, for her keel was solidly joined. But if she could neither glide off nor move, she ran the risk of being forever fastened to these rocks, and then Captain Nemo's submarine vessel would be done for. I was reflecting thus when the captain, cool and calm, always master of himself, approached me. An accident? I asked. No, an incident. But an incident that will oblige you perhaps to become an inhabitant of this land from which you flee? Captain Nemo looked at me curiously and made a negative gesture, as much as to say that nothing would force him to set foot on terra firma again. Then he said, Besides, Monsieur Aronnax, the Nautilus is not lost. It will carry you yet into the midst of the marvels of the ocean. Our voyage is only begun, and I do not wish to be deprived so soon of the honor of your company. However, Captain Nemo, I replied, without noticing this ironical turn of phrase, the Nautilus ran aground in open sea. Now the tides are not strong in the Pacific, and if you cannot lighten the Nautilus, I do not see how it will be reinflated. The tides are not strong in the Pacific. You are right there, Professor. But in Torres Straits, one finds still a difference of a yard and a half between the level of high and low seas. Today is the 4th of January, and in five days the moon will be full. However, uh, now I shall be very much astonished if that satellite does not ra raise these masses of water sufficiently and render me a service that I should be indebted to her for. Having said this, Captain Nemo, followed by his lieutenant, redescended to the interior of the Nautilus. As to the vessel, it moved not and was immovable, as if the coralline polypi had already walled it up with their in indestructible cement. Well, sir, 
said Ned Land, who came up to me after the departure of the captain. Well, friend Ned, we will wait patiently for the tide on the ninth instant, for it appears that the moon will have the goodness to put it off again. Really, really. And this captain is not going to cast anchor at all, since the tide will suffice. Oh, and this captain is not going to cast anchor at all, since the tide will suffice, said Conceal simply. The Canadian looked at Conceal, then shrugged his shoulders. Sir, you may believe me when I tell you that this piece of iron will navigate neither on nor under the sea again. It is only fit to be sold for its weight. I think, therefore, that the time has come to part company with Captain Nemo. Friend Ned, I do not despair of this stout Nautilus as you do, and in four days we shall know what to hold to on the Pacific tides. Besides, flight might be possible if we were in sight of the English or provincial uh, pro provincial uh, coast, but on the Papuan shores it is another thing, and it will be time enough to come to that extremity if the Nautilus does not recover itself again, which I look upon as a grave event. But do they know at least how to act uh, circumspectly? There is an island. On that island there are trees. Under those trees, terrestrial animals, bearers of cutlets and roast beef to which I would willingly give a trial. In this, friend, Ned is right, said Conceal, and I agree with him. Could not Master obtain permission from his friend, Captain Nemo, to put us on land, if only so as to not lose the habit of treading on the solid parts of our planet? I can ask him, but he will refuse. Will Master risk it? asked Conceal, and we shall know how to rely upon the Captain's amiability. To my great surprise, Captain Nemo gave me the permission I asked for, and he gave it very agreeably, without even exacting from me a promise to return to the vessel. But flight across New Guinea might be very perilous, and I should not have counseled Ned Land to attempt it. Better to be a prisoner on board the Nautilus than to fall into the hands of the natives. At eight o'clock, armed with guns and hatchets, we got off the Nautilus. The sea was pretty calm. A slight breeze blew on, on land. Conceal and I rowing, we sped along quickly, and Ned steered in the straight passage that the breakers left between them. The boat was well handled and moved rapidly. Ned Land could not restrain his joy. He was like a prisoner that had escaped from prison and knew not that it was necessary to re-enter it. Meat! We are going to eat some meat, and what meat? He replied, real game, no bread indeed. I do not, I do not say that fish is not good. We, we must not abuse it, but a, but a piece of fresh venison grilled on live coals will agreeably vary our ordinary course. Glutton, said Conceal, he makes my mouth water. It, must, it remains to be seen, I said, if these forests are full of game, and if the game is not such as will hunt the hunter himself. Well said, Monsieur Aranax, replied the Canadian, whose teeth seemed sharpened like the edge of a hatchet. But I will eat tiger, loin of tiger, if there is no other quadruped on this island. Friend, friend Ned is uneasy about it, said Conceal. Whatever it may be, continued Ned Land, every animal with four paws without feathers or with two paws without feathers will be saluted by my first shot. Very well, Master Land's imprudences are beginning. Never fear, Monsieur Aranax, replied the Canadian. I do not want twenty-five minutes to offer you a dish of my sort. At half past eight, the Nautilus boat ran softly aground on a heavy sand after having happily passed the coral reef that surrounds the island of Gilboa. All right, let's keep going. Hello, Amy Beecham. <laughs> All right, great. Let's continue. I was much impressed on touching land. Ned Land tried to the soil with his feet as if to take possession of it. However, it was only two months before that we had become, according to Captain Nemo, passengers on board the Nautilus, but in reality, prisoners of its commander. In a few minutes, we were within musket shot of the coast. The whole horizon was hidden behind a beautiful curtain of forests. Enormous trees, the trunks of which attained a height of 200 feet, were tied to each other by garlands of bindweed, real natural hammocks with a light breeze rocked. They were mimosas, figs, hibisci, and palm trees, mingled together in profusion, and under the shelter of their verdant vault grew orchids, leguminous plants, and ferns. 
But without noticing all these beautiful specimens of Papuan flora, the Canadian abandoned the agreeable for the useful. He discovered a cocoa tree, beat down some of the fruit, broke them, and we drunk the milk and ate the nut with a satisfaction that protested against the ordinary food on the Nautilus. Excellent, said Ned Land. Exquisite, replied Conceal. And I do not think, said the Canadian, that he would object to our introducing a cargo of coconuts on board. I do not think he would, but he would not taste them. So much the worse for him. So much the worse for him, said Conceal. And so much the better for us, replied Ned Land. There will be more for us. One word only, uh, Master Land, I, I said to the harpooner, who was beginning to ravage another coconut tree. Coconuts are good things, but before filling the canoe with them, it would be wise to uh, recon, rec recontre and see if the island does not produce some substance not less useful. Fresh vegetables will be welcome on board the Nautilus. Master is right, replied Conceal, and I propose to reserve three places in our vessel, one for fruits, the other for vegetables, and the third for venison, of which I have not yet seen the smallest specimen. Conceal, we must not despair, said the Canadian. Let us continue, I returned, and lie in wait. Although the island seems uninhabited, it might still contain some individuals that would be less hard than we on the nature of game. Ho, ho, said Ned Land, moving his jaws significantly. Well, Ned, said Conceal, my word, returned the Canadian, I begin to understand the charms of anthropophagy. Ned, Ned, what are you saying? You, a man-eater? I should not feel safe with you, especially as I share your cabin. I might perhaps wake one day to find myself half-devoured. Friend Conceal, I like you much, but not enough to eat you unnecessarily. I would not trust you, replied Conceal, but enough. We must absolutely bring down some game to satisfy this cannibal, or else uh, one of these fine mornings Master will find only pieces of his servant to serve him. While we were, we were talking thus, we were penetrating the somber arches of the forest, and to, for two hours we surveyed it in all directions. Chance rewarded our search for eatable vegetables, and one of the most useful products of the tropical zones furnished us with precious food that we missed on board. I would speak of the breadfruit tree, very abundant in the island of Gilboa, and I remarked chiefly the variety destitute of seeds which bears in Malaya the name of Rima. Ned Land knew these fruits well. He had already eaten many during his numerous voyages, and he knew how to prepare these, the eatable substance. Moreover, the sight of them excited him, and he could contain himself no longer. Master, he said, I shall die if I do not taste a little of this breadfruit pie. Taste it, friend Ned. Taste it as you want. We are here to make experiments. Make them. It won't take long, said the Canadian. And provided with a lintel, he lighted a fire of dead wood that cracked, jo crackled joyously. During this time, Conceal and I chose the best fruits of the breadfruit. Some had not then attained a sufficient degree of maturity, and their thick skin covered a white but rather fibrous pulp. Others, the greater number yellow and gelatinous, waited only to be picked. These fruits enclose no kernel. Conceal brought a dozen to Ned Land, who placed them on a coal fire ha after having cut them in thick slices, and while doing this, repeating, "You will see, Master, how good. Uh, you will see, Master, how good this bread is. More so when one has been deprived of it so long. It, it is not even bread," added he, "but a delicate pastry. Ha you have eaten none, Master? No, Ned." Very well, prepare yourself for a juicy thing. If you do not come for more, I am no longer the king of harpooners. After some minutes, the parts of the fruit that exposed the fire was completely roasted. The interior looked like a white pasty, a sort of soft crumb, the flavor of which was like that of an artichoke. It must be confessed, this bread was excellent, and I ate of it with great relish. What time is it now? asked the Canadian. Two o'clock at least, replied Conceal. How time flies on firm ground, sighed Ned Land. Let us be off, replied Conceal. We returned through the forest and completed our collection by a raid upon the cabbage palms that we gathered from the tops of the trees, little beans that I recognize as the abru of the Malays, and yams of a superior quality. We were loaded when we reached the boat, but Ned Land did not find his provisions sufficient. 
fate, however, favored us. Just as we were pushing off, he perceived several trees from 25 to 30 feet high, a species of palm tree. At last, at five o'clock in the evening, loaded with our riches, we quitted the shore, and half an hour after we hailed the Nautilus. No one appeared on our arrival. The enormous iron-plated cylinder seemed deserted. The provisions embarked, I descended to my chamber, and after sl supper, slept soundly. The next day, the 6th of January, nothing new on board. Not a sound inside, not a sign of life. The boat rested along the edge in the same place in which we had left it. We resolved to return to the island. Ned Land hoped to be more fortunate than on the day before with his regard to the hunt, and wished to visit another part of the forest. At dawn, we set off. The boat, carried on by the waves that flowed to the shore, reached the island in a few minutes. We landed, and thinking that it was better to give in to the Canadian, we followed Ned Land, whose long limbs threatened to distance us. He wound up the coast towards the west, then, fording some turrets, he gained the high plain that was bordered with admirable forests. Some kingfishers were rambling along the watercourses, but they would not let themselves be approached. Their circumspection proved to me that these birds knew what to expect from bipeds of our species, and I concluded that if the island was not inhabited, at least human beings occasionally frequented it. After crossing a rather large prairie, we arrived at the skirts of a little wood that was enlivened by the songs and flight of a large number of birds. There are only birds, said Conceal. But they are eatable, replied the harpooner. I do not agree with you, friend Ned, for I see only parrots there. Friend Conceal, said Ned gravely, the parrot is like pheasant to those who have nothing else. And, I added, this bird, suitably prepared, is worth knife and fork. Indeed, under the thick foliage of the wood, a world of parrots were flying from branch to branch, only needing a careful education to speak the human language. For the moment, they were chattering with parrots of all colors and grave cockatoos who seemed to meditate upon some philosophical problem, whilst brilliant red lorries passed like a piece of bunting carried away by the breeze, papawans with the finest azure colors, and in all a variety of winged things most charming to behold, but few eatable. However, a bird peculiar to these islands, and which has never passed the limits of the Arrow and Papuan Islands, was wanting in this collection but fortune reserved it for me before long. After passing through a moderately thick copse, we found a plain obstructed with, with bush, bushes. I saw then those magnificent birds, the disposition of whose long feathers obliges them to fly against the wind, their undulating flight, graceful aerial curves, and the shading of their colors attracted and charmed one's looks. I had no trouble in recognizing them. Birds of paradise, I exclaimed. The Malays, who carry on a great trade in these birds with the Chinese, have several means that we could not employ for taking them. Sometimes they put snares on the top of high trees that the birds of paradise prefer to frequent. Sometimes they catch them with a vicious, a viscous bird lime that paralyzes their movements. They even go so far as to poison the fountains that the birds generally drink from. But we were obliged to fire at them during flight, which gave us few chances to bring them down, and indeed, we vainly exhausted one half our ammunition. About eleven o'clock in the morning, the first range of mountains that formed the center of the island was traversed, and we had killed nothing. Hunger drove us on. The hunters had relied on the products of the chase, and they were wrong. Happily, Conceal, to his great surprise, made a double shot and secured breakfast. He brought down a white pigeon and a wood pigeon, which, cleverly plucked and suspended from a skewer, was roasted before a red fire of dead wood. While these interesting birds were cooking, Ned prepared the fruit of the bread tree. Then the wood pigeons were devoured to the bones and declared excellent. The nutmeg with which they are in the habit of, habit of stuffing their crops flavors their flesh and renders it delicious eating. Now, Ned, what do you miss now? Some four-footed game, Monsieur Aranax. All these pigeons are only side dishes and trifles, and until I have killed an animal with cutlets, I shall not be content. Nor I, Ned, if I do not catch a bird of paradise. Let us continue hunting, replied Con Let us continue hunting, replied Conceal. Let us go towards the sea. We have arrived at the first declivities of the mountains, and I think we had better regain the region of the forests. That was sensible advice and was followed out. After walking for one hour, we had attained a forest of sago trees. 
Some inoffensive serpents glided away from us. The birds of paradise fled at our approach, and truly I despaired of getting near one when Conceal, who was walking in front, suddenly bent down, uttered a triumphal cry, and came back to me bringing a magnificent specimen. Oh, bravo, Conceal! Master is very good. No, my boy, you have made an excellent stroke. Take one of these living birds and carry it in your hand. If Master will examine it, he will see that I have not deserved great merit. Why, Conceal? Because this bird is as drunk as a quail. Drunk? Yes, sir. Drunk with the nutmegs megs that it devoured under the nutmeg tree under which I found it. See, friend Ned, see the monstrous effects of intemperance? <laughs> By Jove, exclaimed the Canadian, because I have drunk gin for two months, you must needs reproach me. However, I examined the curious bird. Conceal was right. The bird, drunk with the juice, was quite powerless. It could not fly. It could hardly walk. This bird belonged to the most beautiful of the eight species that are found in Papua and in the neighboring islands. It was the large emerald bird, the most rare kind. It measured three feet in length. Its head was comparatively small, its eyes placed near the opening of the beak and also small. But the shades of color were beautiful, having a yellow beak, brown feet and claws, nut-colored wings with purple tips, pale yellow at the back of the neck and head, and emerald color at the throat, chestnut on the breast and belly. Two horned, downy nets rose from below the tail that prolonged the long, light feathers of admirable fineness. And they completed the whole of this marvelous bird that the natives have poetically named the Bird of the Sun. But if my wishes were satisfied the possession of the bird of paradise, the Canadians were not yet. Happily, about two o'clock, Ned Land brought down a magnificent hog from the brood of those the natives call uh, Barry Utang. The animal came in time for us to procure real quadruped meat, and he was well received. Ned Land was very proud of his shot. The hog, hit by the electric ball, fell stone dead. The Canadians skinned and cleaned it properly, having after having taken half a dozen cutlets destined to furnish us with a grilled repast in the evening. Then the hunt was resumed, with, which was still more marked by Ned and Conceal's exploits. Indeed, the two friends beating the bushes roused a herd of kangaroos that fled and bounded along on their elastic paws. But these animals did not take to flight so rapidly, but what the electric capsule could stop their course. Ah, Professor, cried Ned Land, who was carried away by the delights of the chase. What excellent game, and stewed too. What a supply for the Nautilus. Two, three, five down. And to think that we shall eat that flesh and that the idiots on board shall not have a crumb. I think that, in his excess of joy, the Canadian, if he had not talked so much, would have killed them all. But he contented himself with a single dozen of these interesting marsupians. The animals were small. They were a species of those kangaroo rabbits that live habitually in the hollows of trees and whose speed is extreme, but they are moderately fat and furnish at least estimable food. We were very satisfied with the results of the hunt. Happy Ned proposed to return to this enchanting island the next day, for he wished to depopulate it of all edible quadrupeds, but he reckoned without his host. At six o'clock in the evening, we had regained the shore. Our boat was moored at the usual place. The Nautilus, like a long rock, emerged from the waves two miles from the beach. Ned Land, without waiting, occupied himself about the important dinner business. He understood all about cooking well. The bari utang grilled on the coals soon scented the air with a delicious odor. Indeed, the dinner was excellent. Two wood pigeons completed this extraordinary menu. The sago pasty, the ardo carpus bread, some mangoes, half a dozen pineapples, and the liquor fermented from some coconuts overjoyed us. I even think that my worthy companion's ideas had not all the plainness desirable. Suppose we do not return, uh, suppose we do not return to the Nautilus this evening, said Conceal. Suppose we never return, added Ned Land. Just then, a stone fell at our feet and cut short the harpooner's proposition. Ah, so perfect timing to end there today. <laughs>
All right, so thank you all for joining us. Um, we're going to be back on Monday to continue our adventure. And uh, today at 2 p.m. we have our Ask a Historian live stream. So please join us there on uh, Facebook Live and YouTube Live. And um, I also want to encourage you to check out our, or to consider uh, getting a digital membership. These are as low as uh, $3 a month or $35 for the year. Of course, if you can give more, we encourage you to do so as they go towards um, providing these high quality live streams and inviting guest speakers. So I, I do hope that you will uh, get a digital membership so that you can enjoy those members only live streams, uh, podcast episodes, video lessons, and um, our newsletter as well. You also get to receive uh, priority requests for our programming. So lots to enjoy there. And I'll put up um, a link in the chat for our membership information. So you can check that out. There we go, right there. All right, so until Monday, um, please have a wonderful weekend. Stay safe, and I look forward to continuing our adventure on Monday. All right, see you then. Mm -hmm.